um, when you sort of come to a conference like this and look at three actually quite different papers and different subject matters, it's interesting how many things sort of link together as if the three of you had been talking in advance because the same subjects and themes come through again and again. So with um, the three papers, we had Anne of Denmark and then her relationship with Van Soma. And uh, for me, I then thought, oh, how interesting, because then we had the Earl of Butte and his relationship particularly with Alan Ramsey. And then we look at the Princesse de Lamballe and her relationship potentially with Cosway. And we're thinking about these influential sitters of portraits who are also collectors who have impressive art collections or a knowledge of the art scene who have a relationship with the artists who are depicting them and who in themselves are great personalities so I thought the three papers spanning from the early 17th century through to the late 18th were really remarkable for that similarity with that in mind, uh, Wendy, um, to talk about the first, uh, the first paper, with um, Anna Denmark's relationship with um, Van Soma, um, I've been thinking a lot recently about masks and the position of the court mask. And there hasn't been, I mean, there has been some work done on it, but not as much work perhaps as could have been done on the correlation between the mask and the portrait. But then you throw into the mix this sort of spectacle of the hunt as well. Is there anything you could talk to us about that? Uh, I think the mask is absolutely central to understanding Anne of Denmark and Van Soma. And of course, we know that she um, revitalised the mask when she came to the English throne in 1603 and involved Inigo Jones in redefining the visual um, aesthetic of, of the mask mm -hmm. shortly after that. Um, I don't think you can really look at portraits and buildings and their uh, function as separate fields of operation. I think they all absolutely interconnect. Yeah, yeah. One of the been. things that was so fascinating to me in the research into Anne of Denmark and Van Soma is, of course, we don't know of any Van Soma portraits before 1617, and we only know those two, the portrait of Anne of Denmark with o at Oatlands and yeah. the portrait of um, William Herbert, third Earl of Pembroke. Um, and the Oatlands inventory shows that they've both hung together. They both appeared at the same moment at Oatlands in 1617, and yet they are so different as portraits. So the portrait of the Earl of Pembroke is you know, very conventionally a Tudor-style portrait with a dark background and um, yes. very, very simply set yes. um, as an individual. And so that does make you wonder, you were talking about the relationship between the artist and the sitter, yeah. whether Anne of Denmark <sighs> whether she, in commissioning Van Soma, knew how she wanted that portrait to look, that she knew that, like the peak portrait earlier yeah. of, of her children... Similarly of, very large. Similarly very large, and yeah. similarly set within landscapes and uh, with a horse in the background, whether she said... I, because Van Soma would have seen the peak portraits. The interesting thing is that Anne of Denmark lived with those portraits. She inherited Tudor yeah. portraits, and as soon as she takes on the throne, she begins to commission, or um, her family begin to commission, portraits that redefine the aesthetic of the monarchy. She preferred paintings to people. I remember famously she <laughs> said that, which is something I can relate to sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what about um, when we're talking about the um, Earl of Butte? Um, do you think that he had a sense of humour? No. He, um, <laughs> uh, oh, no, uh, he famously uh, was very alienating at the court for being very serious, very pompous. Uh, part of the reason, I think, that's part of the reason he appealed to the young Prince George, who was similarly known as very diffident, uh, formal, stuffy. So, uh, and there is written evidence, uh, particularly the Le Montagnier mm -hmm. pamphlet, that Butte wanted it suppressed. Right. And um, commissioned Smollett to write negative reviews of it, and I, he did not have a sense of humour about this no. at all. But many of the people, uh, Horace Walpole, for example, seems to very much have had a sense of humour about Butte and Butte's penis. And you find what you look for, I suppose, but his um, diaries and letters are full of coded references to um, the Earl of Lincoln and his endowment. And mm -hmm. bizarrely, uh, the more you look for these things in medical literature, aristocratic analysts and satirical prints, there's a real kind of undercurrent a very basic boyish humour, both elite and popular. Hmm. In the portrait you showed as well, the columns, is that, I mean, is that significant at all, those sort of very... The 
the, I, in the, behind him. The connection. The leg-like columns or the column-like legs. Or? I don't think there's any. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't argue that Ramsey intended um, this message that I've teased out of this portrait. Yeah. I was kind of proposing that as a conceit in a way of looking around these portraits, especially for artists like Ramsey, where the uh, prevailing scholarship is so connoisseurial and there's almost nothing thematic or probing written about Ramsey other than catalogues and yeah. the typical uh, problem with Scottish art of art and enlightenment, which yeah. actually doesn't do much to, um, to really focus on the intense rivalry between Ramsey and Reynolds, um, to explore the reasons why Ramsey uh, shied away from the burgeoning public institutions yeah. in the period, although he was a very eminent artist. So I was using that kind of way of looking at the portrait as a way of trying to step away from purely stylistic yeah. and connoisseurial kind of approaches to Ramsey. Because seeing Reynolds actually emulate Ramsey was again something I hadn't thought about before and the, those direct links where we yeah. know the animosity was there. I think it was really interesting visually to do. And the king hated Reynolds as well and I think the, the relationship between Butte, George III, Ramsey and Reynolds was incredibly fraught. Um, with some minor public spats, and even mm. Reynolds having to beg to paint the portraits of the King and Queen for the Royal Academy uh, <laughs> to gain the office of painter in ordinary. I mean, it's, it's quite a... Yeah, an intense... A naughty type. little relationship. Yeah, naughty. Ian, do you have a question? D talking about men's legs, <laughs> which I think is the topic on the table at the moment, um, to what extent the thing I'm thinking of, the, the, the prototype really, I suppose, is, is the portraits of Louis XIV, mm -hmm. who of course was famously um, proud of his legs as well. And to what extent do you think that maybe Ramsey particularly, who was so aware of the French um, context, the French um, influence, is, is nodding towards, say, Rigaud? Um, I, th I think there's a connection between aristocratic status and physique, which the legs plays into. But in a British context, um, legs are imbued with extraordinary uh, capacity to um, characterise national identity, um, manliness. Just previous, I mean, this, this um, paper today is incredibly condensed. But there is, a, there is an entire discourse of legs, um, English oak and legs, oak trees. And then you have French legs, typically the figure of the, Fran of the Frenchman is an emaciated, either macaroni or the dancing master's skinny French legs. I wouldn't have been very successful in the 18th century. I have very skinny legs. Um, so legs have this incredible capacity to um, speak of more than just the body, but of the nation, uh, the nation under threat. And then typically in accounts where legs are nationed, to coin a horrible phrase, very, the very next focus is the male genitals, which are similarly have a capacity um, to iterate Racial difference uh, is a good example where lots of the 18th century literature on black people and slavery, the pseudoscience, did the thing of othering black people by enormous penises and all this kind of uh, but cultural baggage that still to an extent exists. But male physiques were incredibly eloquent, is my point in a line. <laughs> okay. We have a question at the back too, actually. Um, so the lady further back first and then the lady in front. Thank you. Um, you read out uh, a description of the um, the pose uh, of Butte uh, holding up the uh, the gown. Uh, is there any evidence about how that uh, composition was arrived at? Whether it's the sitter or Ramsay that's uh, come to the the way of doing it. Um, I think it's. The most basic um, answer would be it's derived from classical poses of toga-holding senators. But um, things that I mentioned in this speech, for example, Smith's uh, anecdote of the counterpointing of the Marquis of Rockingham's legs and the Earl of Butte's legs in Ramsay and Reynolds' respective portraits, in the context of this very brief paper, they read as um, throwaway comparisons. But actually, if you unpick a lot of these comparisons, Ramsay, Butte, Reynolds, Rockingham, you have a very prominent Whig and a very prominent Tory, and there's a whole political um, dialogue kind of strangely hinted at via reference to these men's legs. Mm 
their positions at court, their bearing and status. So whilst many of the things in this paper in a kind of accessible and short form seem throwaway, you, you really can unpick um, narratives about legs, bodies, penises. And I don't want to fall into the trap of, um, maybe I shouldn't say, it, but a Vic Gattrell kind of trap of reading these um, examples in 18th century culture as being bawdy or yeah. somehow lighthearted. Very often they're not uh, lighthearted and they, they engage with serious issues such as national identity, Anglo-Scottish relations in a, in a strange idiom, but one at the time which I don't think was appreciated solely for its bawdiness. I agree with that so much. So often with satire, we find ourselves having that unsettling, serious undercurrent. Mm. And actually, you find yourself learning so much about the political situation almost by default. And then that afterwards is a thing that stays with you rather than the humour, I think. Lovely. Um, there was another question here. Um, hi, uh, this is again for Jordan, um, just thinking a bit more about legs. Um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking about, have you had a look at the Ramsey portrait of Earl Temple um, of Stowe? Yep. Um, lots of leg. A, yeah, lots of leg. <laughs> uh, notorious for being a, a very tall and having no sense of humour. Um, I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on that portrait. Um, it's of particular interest to, to me at Stowe. Um, but also his um, supposed portrait um, in the frieze of the South Front Portal portico of Stowe where he is depicted as apparently as Bacchus with very long legs. Um, so again this is obviously something that he was aware of and wanted to portray in some sense. So basic thoughts on legs would be, I have actually a colleague at the University of Edinburgh who has a whole chapter on legs and she'll be furious that I'm um, answering these questions and not her. Her name's um, Liz Garnett. Um, so legs, aristocratic legs walk a fine line between robust uh, masculinity and refined grace. So in portraits like Ramsay's of Butte and Temple, you see these really quite big legs, um, big muscly legs, but in these very dainty poses. So I think there's a, a visual balancing between rough, mis rough masculine physicality and grace, which is interesting. But the, I don't think that Ramsay intended necessarily Butte's legs to become such a focal point. It's what's interesting about these portraits is that the portrait of Butte is essentially a dull, formal, man-robe portrait, but it becomes seized upon in ways which would, I certainly wouldn't say were intended. And there was another slide, which I didn't have time to look at in my um, paper, which, like the um, bagpipe penis print, is one, again, of Butte as Colossus, where it's directly modelled on Ramsay's portrait, and again, you have these huge legs. So, I don't know if there's any link in Ramsey's intention between the depiction of those, those two men's legs, and I think it would be very hard to argue there was, but what is interesting is how Butte's physicality was seized upon. Literally, you find, it's quite extraordinary, Walpole, the Earl of Hardwick, um, the, 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 it crops up in diaries, Butte's legs, it's in Butte's correspondence to other people about private theatricals, pink ties, his huge legs. So this, again, these, these legs were famous legs. <laughs> but I don't necessarily think uh, Ramsay intended to celebrate them in such, a, in such a way. Yeah, I think he wanted to celebrate them, but not to make them public currency. So he discusses his own legs then? He, he does just um, discuss his own legs? He discusses his own, he, he, he is vain. Um, and he's very tall. And I think physically he's very threatening. Um, at court. He is considerably taller from accounts than most of the other courtiers. He is supposedly very popular with the ladies. So I think that there is a sense also of just at the period when George II's court is waning and George III's is coming to prominence that there's been a clear out of these slightly fusty old men. And so there's also a kind of primal kind of um, reaction to Butte mm -hmm. as being this strapping Mm -hmm. guy from the north. And where did he appear from? He is not from a particularly prominent family. They're junior Scottish earls, never had huge positions at court. And then all of a sudden, Butte rises up in the heir to the thrones household as prince, and then all the way up to the highest political position in the kingdom very quickly after the mm -hmm. accession. The two the kind of threatening physical presence, the threatening presence of Scots in London, of their increasing artistic and political sway, 
suddenly coalesces around Butte and he becomes a bogeyman. None of the critique against him, political critique is necessarily detailed mm -hmm. or policy based. It's he's a Scot, he's this, he's shagged the king's mother. He's, it's not specific. But to go back to that issue of shagging the boot. <laughs> Remember the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut that bit, right? <laughs> the original sources are far ridden. I know it, I know it. But to what extent is Butte's physicality a means of undermining Princess Augusta's authority, which had been considerable, and that misogyny and the caricatures associated with it were her ruination? Yeah, That's and the king and George III vowed never to forgive the people who had insulted his mother. I think there's a heavy dose of misogyny. Uh, Wilkes's essay on woman, which features a kind of very um, rude quote I had on my opening slide, is hugely misogynistic and has an inevitable reference of Butte's penis in it. So those two, I mean, um, I think to try and locate misogyny in 18th century political and popular culture is a mad pursuit in the first place because I think we have to take it as read that misogyny is rife, mm. that there's, mm. there's mm. no example really yeah. of non-misogynistic political discourse in the period. Well, with the exception of Catherine Macaulay and Wollstonecraft, who are women who produce political discourse, but I, I take it as read that 18th century political culture is mm. inherently misogynistic. Yeah. So, but it mm. definitely plays in. So and xenophobic because she's German. Mm. It's inflammatory stuff. Yeah. And then that sense of suspicion of the other. I mean, it's what you see also in the reactions to Benjamin West and to Copley and that sort of really bitchy attitude that you have and the artists sort of grouping together to defame them. It's all part of the same thing. So I think when you put the otherness of the Scottishness plus that quick rise to fame plus this, um, the power, it's, it's inflammatory stuff. The public discourse in the 18th century is amazingly base and yeah. tawdry, similar to our own in a way. Um, the more you delve, it's, it's depressing. And also the anti-Scottish mm. material in this period is almost difficult to read as a Scot. It's oh, incredible. <laughs> so let's um, dwell on the female issue again now. Sarah, I wanted to ask you about the um, images, um, so the Princess de Lambelle collecting these images of influential women. Do we know how many of them that she actually met? Uh, it's a good question. Um, actually, it was Marie Antoinette, portrait prints that I have the sort of the most information about because yeah. those are the ones that are described in a lot of detail in the Queen's bills and yeah. her accounts whereas um, Lombard's it just says portrait print it won't right. actually say who they are but um, certainly a lot of um, the English tour were traveling to Paris and Versailles and had audiences with the Queen and Lombard met a lot of the kind of key figures in England as well when she came over in 1787 and then very briefly in 1791 because she arrived and then she heard about the um, the capture of the King Queen of Varennes, so she immediately turned around and went back. So she was only probably in England for a few hours in 1791, <laughs> um, but still, nonetheless. Um, so it's sort of, it's difficult to say, but she was definitely friends with um, the Prince of Wales and Queen Charlotte, and they wrote very movingly, actually, when they heard about her death. Their correspondence reveals that they were writing to each other, saying how terrible it was and how awful her death was, and they were both sort of sickened and appalled by it. Mm. Um, Horace Walpole was excluded, so we know she didn't meet him, and I think he was hoping secretly that she might write okay. to him and ask for an invitation to Strawberry Hill, but she didn't, so he was uh, very disappointed about that. Um, but there is certainly, in the Times and all the papers of the time, they were sort of describing exactly who she met and where mm. I could sort of reel off a long list, but it probably wouldn't be hugely interesting. <laughs> um, but yes, no, she was well known. And actually, even before she arrived in 1787, all the newspapers had sort of documented her rise at court. Because although she came from an important court in Turin, it was still somewhat peripheral. Mm. And she did have this um, enormous sort of uh, rise in, in fame and influence once she became superintendent of the Queen's household, which was a very important position. Mm. And it was also a position that had um, been wound down originally because of the enormous powers that its holder enjoyed. Mm. So she was resented by all the courtiers for <laughs> holding this position. And it was obviously well remunerated. And, um, and also it was assumed for, that it was largely titular, but actually she had a huge amount of, sort of responsibility. She mm controlled a lot of the 
she controlled all the female courtiers under her and also a lot of the male courtiers too. And she was the person who authorised the payment of their salaries and their pensions. So obviously wow. it, it sort of encouraged a certain amount of subservience. Mm. And so, yes, yeah, so she was enormously powerful. And so all this was documented in the papers in England mm. long before she even arrived. Mm. And also because there was this whole sort of scandal around her as well because she arrived in France to marry the French prince, prince de Lombard, who died 15 months later of syphilis. And he had um, absconded with one of his mistresses taking her, her diamonds first. Oh. And he'd done all sorts of terrible, <laughs> terrible things to her. So this sort of stigma um, was attached to her, even though she may or may not have been infected as well with syphilis, it's mm. possible. She then had to present a very um, demure image. And anyway, so all of this kind of salacious gossip had crossed yeah. the channel. So before she even arrived, people were extremely interested. fascinated and, and interested to see what she was going to be like when she got there. And the press as well, no doubt. Um, who was facilitating her travel around, around England? Uh, good question. I mean, the introductions were provided by um, the Dowager Duchess of Ancaster, who was her English counterpart. So mm. she was the equivalent of... of the role that Lombard occupied in mm -hmm. France. And the Duke of Richmond provided a number of introductions to the Duke of Queensbury. Um, she was friends, seemingly, with the Duchess of Devonshire. Actually, oh. secretly, the Duchess of Devonshire was trying to undermine her because oh. she was, sorry, it sounds like a, an episode <laughs> of EastEnders. Um, but she was, she was um, more loyal to the Duchess of Polignac, who was her great rival. And so the Duchess of Devonshire was actually planting information, negative information, about Lombard in the papers mm -hmm. at the time. At the same time, she dedicated some poetry to her and did all kinds of nice things. It was all very, as you said, the 18th century was horrible. <laughs> We're all very lucky we live in the 21st century. Well. We have a question at the back on the right there. A microphone is coming. Thank you. Um, it's a question for Wendy. I was very interested in your suggestion that Anne of Denmark might have commissioned the portrait of uh, Pembroke. And can I make a suggestion, which is that Anne of Denmark faces to our right, and that may be an expression of her independence from her husband, but Pembroke actually faces to our left. So if they hung together, <laughs> then they would make a very interesting pairing. And of course, his reputation was very similar to that of Bute in his, in his uh, fascination with the ladies, Clarendon says he's immoderately given over to women. That's a lovely question. Thank you very much. And I, and I have to say, this is a new research area for me. And so it's, I've really been doing a lot of online research and a lot of online playing with images. And of course, images behave very differently on the screen to when you're looking at full-scale painting. So yes, I have put the third Ella Pembroke next to Anne of Denmark and thought, OK, so they look like a couple. Um, but they also don't at all look like a couple. And um, socially, th there was such a, a realm of difference between them. And they did hang in different galleries. So Anne of Denmark's own portrait is hung in the South Gallery. And it's interesting to me that she had that portrait hung next to Elizabeth I's, who, of course, was her predecessor as queen on the English throne, whereas the Earl of Pembroke is in the North Gallery, so in a separate space. Um, but it, it, one of the things that I am fascinated by is the way that we curate images um, and the way that we do that online by comparison to the way that the physicality of paintings um, have their own integrity and their own immense presence. And of course, we can play with those images on screens and look at them together in a very 21st century mm. um, context context, but I think thinking about them in the early 17th century context, that relationship would have been um, really rigorously defined in ways that we can't understand, but I love the idea of it. I find that really fascinating because it's changed so much the way that we look at paintings and you would think it would make us look with more rigour but instead somehow we look quicker and in less detail and so it's something that's completely transformed art history and I think us trying to keep up with that and questioning it constantly is, is really important.
Well, what a wonderful morning it's been, everybody. Um, we're going to have lunch now, which will go on till two o'clock, which is it's in the um, education studio just out there, I think, to the left. Um, but I know that our speakers will be very happy to take any further questions you might have. And just a thought that unites all three of this morning's distinguished papers, actually two thoughts. Firstly, I'm really looking forward to seeing all of this work published, because all of it is absolutely outstanding. And the second thought is that the context is all in portraits all the time, the context is all. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Thank you.